Hello and welcome to Zoology 142. This is lecture one of the circulatory system. Today we're going to be focusing on blood. So blood is one of three components of the human circulatory system. Uh, the first of these components is the heart. Everybody knows that the heart is a muscular chamber. It has four chambers in fact and its job is to pump blood throughout the body. The blood vessels on the other hand are the actual plumbing through which the blood is pumped. We have three different kinds of blood vessels, uh, arteries, veins, and also capillaries. And finally, blood is the tissue that carries oxygen, it also carries nutrients, and it's important to remember that blood is a connective tissue. That is, it has cells, red cells and white cells, and it also has an extracellular matrix. This extracellular matrix is plasma. So in today's lecture we're going to focus exclusively on blood and everybody should already know that one of the major functions of blood is to transport oxygen to the cells in the body. Remember that cells need oxygen in order to extract energy or ATP out of the food molecules that we eat. Another function of blood is to transport nutrients from the digestive system to the body cells. So think about the last time you ate a big meal, let's say you ate nachos, and those are broken down in the stomach, uh, the small intestine, and those nutrients are absorbed through blood vessels in those organs, and they're transmitted to the liver and eventually into the bloodstream where they feed the body cells. From the previous chapter, you should remember that the blood is the primary transport medium for hormones. So hormones are produced in endocrine tissues and are transported through the bloodstream until they get to their target tissues. So for an example, when the pancreas secretes insulin, that insulin travels to the bloodstream and goes to the target tissues, which are basically most of the cells of the human body. Another function of blood is to transport waste molecules uh, from the body cells to the excretory organs. Here we're talking about principally the kidneys. So for example, when you digest proteins, you're going to break those proteins down into amino acids. And as you break the amino acids down, you're going to create some nitrogenous wastes, such as ammonia or urea. And we have to get rid of that urea from the blood very quickly, otherwise it can become quite toxic. And so one of the functions of the blood is to transmit those waste products to the kidneys so they can be excreted from the body. Another oft overlooked uh, function of blood is actually to distribute body heat. So think about how your body changes, let's say if you're going to the gym and working out. You go to the gym, you get on the treadmill, you run for 30 minutes, and your face is going to be very flushed, your skin is going to be very flushed, and that flushing occurs because blood vessels in the outside of your skin dilate, and they bring the blood very close to the surface, and that's why you get that red coloration. The purpose of this is to help to dissipate excess heat from the body. By the same token, imagine that you are very cold, you've just jumped in a very cold lake, or you've been immersed in cold water for a long period of time. When you come out of that water, your skin's going to be very pale because the blood vessels in the skin have constricted in order to keep the blood deep within the core of the body and prevent further heat loss. And finally, another function of blood that people often forget is that it's a wonderful pH buffering mechanism. Your blood is slightly alkaline. It has a pH of around 7.4. Even though you might be consuming, let's say, acidic foods or basic foods, or your bloodstream might have a lot of carbon dioxide in it, your blood is very good at buffering the pH and keeping within about 7.35 to 7.45. For example, think about if you were to eat something with vinegar in it. Uh, vinegar is fairly acidic. It has a pH of 6, and if your blood got to a pH of 6, you would be dead. So even though consume something that has a fairly acidic pH, your blood can buffer that and excrete the excess hydrogen ions in the urine. So the blood has this wonderful pH buffering ability that can keep us within homeostasis. Now, although today's topic is blood, it's important to realize that blood is just one of several fluids in the human body. Uh, we already said that one of the functions of blood is to transport nutrients, to transport oxygen throughout the body, and blood is normally only contained within blood vessels. On the other hand, there's other fluids within the body. Starting at the cell, we have intracellular fluid. Intracellular fluid is the fluid within the cell, and it's principally in the form of cytoplasm. Outside of the cell, we have a different type of fluid called interstitial fluid. Interstitial literally means between. And so interstitial fluid doesn't have any blood cells. It has maybe just a few electrolytes, but it is a transport medium between the cell and the blood. So as blood gives off nutrients, it's going to transit into the interstitial fluid and then finally into the intracellular fluid. And the last type, this should be labeled number four, is lymph. 
Uh, lymphatic fluid is basically excess interstitial fluid that is sucked up by lymphatic vessels and capillaries and eventually it is put back into the circulatory system as blood. We'll learn more about lymph and the lymphatic system in another chapter. So in order to maintain homeostasis, the body actually has to exchange nutrients and oxygen and carbon dioxide across these four fluids. And that movement occurs through simple diffusion in most cases. So for example, the bloodstream will have more oxygen than the body cells or the interstitial fluid will. So that oxygen will diffuse from an area of high concentration, the blood, into the interstitial fluid and eventually into the intracellular fluid. On the other hand, waste products like carbon dioxide tend to be more abundant in the cells themselves. So they diffuse from the intracellular fluid through the interstitial fluid and eventually back into the bloodstream where they can be gotten rid of in the lungs. So this slide is just a simple diagram of three of the most important body fluids, that is blood, interstitial fluid, and lymph. Remember that blood is confined exclusively to the blood vessels, that is the arteries, veins, and capillaries, and arterioles. And blood contains plasma. It also contains cells. Those are the red things you see. Those are the red blood cells. It also contains proteins. The proteins are what you see are the green little things. And one of the large proteins we have in blood is albumin. So blood has proteins, it has water, it has cells, and some of this fluid actually leaks out of capillaries to become interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid, you can see below, doesn't have any cells in there, doesn't have any large proteins. Those little circles you see in there are just ions. So interstitial fluid does have sodium, it has potassium, it has chloride ions, but ideally it doesn't have any of the larger cells. And finally, lymph is just interstitial fluid that has been sucked up by the lymphatic capillaries. Think of the lymphatic capillaries as being sort of a sump pump for the circulatory system. Any excess water or uh, interstitial fluid that leaks out of the bloodstream is going to be siphoned up by the lymphatic capillaries and eventually returned to the bloodstream in the subclavian vein. So now we're going to talk about some of the physical characteristics of blood. Most people have encountered blood some point in their lifetimes. Either you've had a patient that's had bleeding, or let's say you've just cut yourself, and you've probably even licked your finger. And so you know that when you cut yourself, blood is in fact salty. It contains electrolytes. It's also fairly viscous, at least when compared to water. That is, it is thicker, and the reason it's thick is because it contains cells and it also contains some proteins. The temperature of blood is actually higher than normal body temperature, which is 98.6, otherwise 37 degrees Celsius. So the normal temperature of blood is actually 100.4. The next thing is the pH of blood. Remember the pH scale measures the acidity or alkalinity of a substance. And as we go down in the pH scale from 7 to 0, we're becoming acidic. And as we go from 7 to 14, we're becoming more and more basic. So blood has a slightly alkaline pH at around 7.4. It can vary from 7.35 to 7.45. If you get much below 7.35, we say that you're in acidosis, and that can be a life-threatening condition. On the other hand, if you get above 7.45, we would say that you have alkalosis, that your blood is alkaline, and that can be life-threatening as well. So blood is a connective tissue, and it actually comprises uh, a fair amount of our body weight. 8% uh, of our body weight is blood. And if you know somebody's weight and you know that this 8% rule, you can actually estimate the amount of blood that that person will have in their body. And of course, that depends on body weight and whether they're male or female. But in general, uh, males tend to have 5 to 6 liters of blood. That's just over a gallon, whereas females tend to have 4 to 5 liters. So you should remember that it's 3.78 liters to a gallon, so we know we've got a gallon plus of blood in our body. Uh, normally you can take 5 to 10 percent of this if you need to do a blood draw without uh, risking that person and putting them into shock or, or hemorrhagic shock. So we'll talk about that later on in the lecture. It's important to know that our blood volume is regulated by a negative feedback mechanism to maintain the right ratio of cells and also the right ratio of plasma. 
So if you've ever gone to the hospital or the doctor's office and had some blood drawn, they've probably spun that blood down into its two major components. And the liquid component of blood is called plasma. Remember, blood is connective tissue, and so the matrix of this connective tissue is called plasma. So somewhere between 50 to 60 percent of our blood is going to be this plasma, whereas the remainder, the 40 to 50 percent, is going to be the formed elements. These are the cells. Of the cells, 99% of what's there are going to be erythrocytes or red blood cells, whereas less than 1% will be the leukocytes or white blood cells, and even a lesser volume will be the platelets. Platelets are also known as thrombocytes, and they're very important in blood clotting. So now let's take a closer look at blood plasma. Blood plasma is the matrix of blood, and it is very aqueous. That is, over 90% of blood plasma is actually water. About 7% are plasma proteins, such as albumin, which are created in the liver. Albumin is probably the most important of the plasma proteins because it maintains osmotic pressure. You should remember from Zoology 141 that osmosis is the movement of water across a semipermeable membrane, and that one of the things that affects this movement is the distribution of solutes. So albumin is a large solute that is in the bloodstream, and it helps to maintain the water in the bloodstream instead of leaking out into the interstitial spaces. You've probably heard of albumin before because in addition to being in the bloodstream, it's also one of the major components of eggs. So maybe you had some albumin for breakfast. Globulins, on the other hand, are also known as immunoglobulins. These are antibodies that are made in the white blood cells, principally the B lymphocytes. And they are kind of like very specific bullets or throwing stars that our white blood cells use to eliminate certain types of pathogens from the body. So we're going to talk more about immunoglobulins when we talk about the immune system in a couple chapters. The last uh, major blood plasma component is something called fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is a liquid protein that normally just floats around in the blood, but if we have a break in a blood vessel, this liquid will be converted into solid fibrin, and that fibrin can help us to aid in blood clotting, otherwise known as hemostasis. And it's very important to have hemostasis so that we don't have too much bleeding or hemorrhage. And we'll talk about that in just a few slides when we talk about the platelets and thrombocytes. In addition to proteins in water, there are some other components that are important in blood plasma. These include organic nutrients, such as carbohydrates. For example, glucose is definitely present in the blood. We have about 90 milligrams per deciliter in our blood, which, if you were to look at your whole bloodstream, equates to about one to two of those little sugar packets you find on a restaurant table. We also have amino acids in our bloodstream. Those amino acids are used to construct proteins, and they're also derived from the digestion of proteins within our digestive tract. There's also lipid in our blood plasma at times. Particularly if you eat a fatty meal, you will actually have lipemia, where you have a fair amount of lipid in the blood plasma, and this can actually mess up some types of blood testing. So a lot of times, if you're going in for a blood test, they'll ask that you fast for at least six hours before they do that. And finally, there's also vitamins present in the bloodstream. For example, your B vitamins, your K vitamins. And some of these, such as vitamin K, are absolutely essential for blood clotting or hemostasis. In addition to the organic nutrients, we also have hormones. Remember that hormones were chemical messengers that were uh, manufactured by our endocrine organs. And these hormones are transported from the endocrine tissue through the bloodstream into their source tissue where they're going to have an effect. And finally, there's some metabolic wastes in the blood plasma as well. One big metabolic waste is carbon dioxide, which is created through cellular metabolism. And another byproduct is urea. Urea is a nitrogenous waste product. That is, it contains the element nitrogen, and it's principally derived from the breakdown of proteins uh, and amino acids in the digestive tract. And as it turns out, protein metabolism is quite toxic, and it produces things like urea and ammonia. And if we let these accumulate, the body can become poisoned very, very quickly. So one job of the blood is to transmit the urea and other nitrogenous wastes to the kidneys where it can be excreted from the body. While we're talking about plasma, we should also talk about the difference between serum and plasma. So if we spin down blood without letting it clot, the clear stuff over top of that is called plasma. 
On the other hand, if we let the blood clot first and then spin it down, maybe 10 or 15 minutes later, what we get is serum. So serum is simply blood plasma with the clotting factors, fibrin, fibrinogen, removed. And serum and plasma are both important in a diagnostic sense and that we use both of these to do what we call blood chemistry tests. So one great thing about blood serum and blood plasma is that because they've been circulating through all the major body organs, the liver, the kidneys, things like that, we can oftentimes determine the health of these organs by looking at certain components in the blood serum or plasma. So if you suspect somebody might have kidney disease or liver disease, you can do a simple blood test and find out how well these organs are functioning without having to do some kind of really invasive test. Another thing that I should point out while we're on the topic of plasma is that remember plasma is the majority of blood volume, about 90%, and plasma therefore is very important for maintaining blood pressure. So if we have somebody that has experienced an injury and has lost a lot of blood, we can replace that blood if we have a compatible blood type. For example, if you have AB negative blood, we're going to have to give you AB negative blood or maybe O negative blood. But we don't always have blood on hand, particularly in the battlefield. Because blood is a perishable product, it's difficult to carry in the battlefield. And so if you have somebody that has lost a lot of blood, your options aren't as good. So one of the things you can use are simple plasma expanders. These can be something simple such as normal saline or isotonic saline pictured at the lower left. So anytime you go to the hospital, you're in for surgery or for some other procedure, you may be given IV fluids and one of the most common IV fluids is sodium chloride which is 0.9 percent and we choose that percentage because it is isotonic to intracellular fluid. That is it has the same osmotic pressure. Another thing we can use is something called HETA starch. HETA starch is like sodium chloride, but here it also has large starch molecules, which when present within the intravascular space, that is the blood vessels, helps to maintain the osmotic pressure within the blood vessels. So it keeps fluid from leaking out of the blood vessels, and it helps to keep the blood pressure higher, which is very important if you have somebody with a low blood volume because their blood pressure will usually go down as well. So in addition to plasma, the other important component of blood is the formed elements. Uh, we call it the formed elements rather than the cells because, in fact, not all of the things within the formed elements are actually cells. So first of all, the most abundant of the formed elements are the erythrocytes, or red blood cells. And as you probably know, these help to carry oxygen. Over 99% of our formed elements are in fact going to be red blood cells. Next in importance are our white blood cells. White blood cells are also known as leukocytes and they can be divided into granular and agranular leukocytes. And we'll talk about both of these uh, later on in some detail. As you probably know, the leukocytes help to ward off infectious organisms such as bacteria, viruses. They even help to eliminate and destroy cancerous cells. And finally, we have our platelets, otherwise known as thrombocytes. Platelets are, in fact, fragments of cells. They're not whole cells. And these fragments help with the process of hemostasis, or blood clotting, if we have a break in a blood vessel. All of the formed elements, including the thrombocytes, the leukocytes, and the erythrocytes, are derived and manufactured in the red bone marrow, which is located within spongy bone. And spongy bone is abundant uh, in the epiphyses of long bones as well as in the hip bones and other areas of the body. And so within this spongy bone, we have a certain type of cell called a pluripotent stem cell. You probably recall from the news that a stem cell is a cell that can become several different types of cells in the body. Uh, for example, an embryonic stem cell can become absolutely any type of cell in the human body. On the other hand, the pluripotent stem cells we have within red bone marrow can not become any cell in the body, but they can become any type of blood cell. So these pluripotent stem cells will differentiate or go down one path or the other based on different factors and hormones that are being secreted and reaching the red bone marrow. So the stem cell will differentiate into blasts, and blasts are basically immature blood cells. For example, the stem cell could divide to become a 
proerythroblast, and this is sort of an early type of red blood cell. It actually has a nucleus, which normal red blood cells don't, and then by the time it leaves the bone marrow, it has ejected that nucleus and become a functional erythrocytes. On the other hand, it can also differentiate into something called a monoblast, and a monoblast will eventually mature to become a monocyte, which is an important part of our immune defense. And so the pluripotent stem cell can literally become any of the blood cells in our body. Now let's take a look at the most abundant of the formed elements, and that would be the erythrocytes or red blood cells. As you already know, the function of erythrocytes is to transport oxygen throughout the body. It picks up this oxygen in the lungs and it transports it to the systemic circuit that is the body tissues. Uh, red blood cells tend to be very, very small. They're about 8 microns in diameter and they're also biconcave. They're almost like a donut that's not quite punched through in the middle. And this small size and weird shape gives us some flexibility so that we can get through the very tiny blood vessels known as capillaries. And it also gives us increased surface area, which is essential to exchanging gases. Remember, the greater surface area to volume ratio you have, the quicker things can diffuse across a membrane. So the primary job of the red blood cells is to transport oxygen to the body's tissues. And they do this very efficiently because of their small size and a very large surface area. The other thing you should know about red blood cells is that even though they transport oxygen, they themselves have anaerobic metabolism. That is, they don't have any mitochondria. And this is kind of important because their job is to transport oxygen, and you certainly don't want them using that oxygen as they travel through the bloodstream. Just as you wouldn't want a waiter taking food to your table that was incredibly hungry because by the time that food gets there, there may not be much of it. The other thing to know about the red blood cells is they don't have a nucleus. Mature cells have no nucleus, and because they have no nucleus, they cannot repair themselves, they cannot manufacture new proteins, and so as a result, red blood cells tend to have a very limited lifespan of about 120 days. And finally, it's important to remember that like the other blood cells, erythrocytes are manufactured in the red bone marrow. Erythrocytes, or red blood cells, really are remarkable body cells. In addition to not having a nucleus and not having any organelles, they also contain millions upon millions of hemoglobin molecules. Basically, it's a big bag of hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the pigment that's essential to carrying oxygen. And hemoglobin consists of a globin component, that is a protein component, as well as iron. That's where the heme comes from. And one red blood cell can carry 1.2 billion oxygen molecules. The other thing about erythrocytes is they change color with oxygen content. Deoxygenated blood tends to be dark purple to lavender in color, whereas oxygenated blood tends to be bright red in color. So next time you watch a slasher movie where somebody's taking a chainsaw and slashing somebody's head off, watch to see what color the blood is. If it comes out in a bright red torrent, you know that that is arterial blood. Other things about red blood cells is they have a very short lifespan, around 100 to 120 days. And that's because they don't have a nucleus, they don't have any organelles, so if their membrane is damaged, they can't repair it. And so these red blood cells, as they age, are pulled out in the spleen and the liver. The amount of red blood cells that are destroyed in a day is just phenomenal. To keep up with the red blood cell destruction that occurs in our spleen and liver, we actually have to manufacture over 2 million red blood cells every second. And so one of the major functions of the red bone marrow is just cranking out more and more erythrocytes to replace the ones that die. We said before that blood was basically divided into two components, that is, the formed elements, which are primarily the red blood cells, and also the blood plasma. So when we spin blood down, we can use that ratio of cells to plasma as an indicator of our oxygen carrying ability. Because again, the major component of the formed elements are our red blood cells, which carry oxygen. And we call this ratio the hematocrit, or the packed cell volume. And on average, males have a hematocrit uh, somewhere between 40 to 55 percent, whereas females have one that's between 38 and 46 percent. That means that if we spin down their blood, 38 to 46 percent of that will be made up of cells, and the remainder will be made up of plasma. 
and so we can use the hematocrit or pack cell volume as an indicator of our oxygen carrying ability. Now it's not absolute, there's other indicators as well, but if you have a lower than normal hematocrit or pack cell volume, we say that you are anemic, that is you have a lower than normal oxygen carrying ability. On the other hand, if you have an elevated hematocrit, let's say you're a male and your hematocrit is 65 instead of being 55, we then say that you have polycythemia, and that can mean having too many cells, which can be dangerous as well. So this slide just shows the process of obtaining somebody's hematocrit. If you start in the lower left, we're going to take a little bit of blood from the finger or other place in the body. We're going to put that in a small hematocrit tube. We're going to seal that tube and put it in a centrifuge. We're going to spin it around very, very quickly, and that's going to cause all the cells to go towards the outside of the centrifuge. And the result is what you see on the right-hand side of your screen. So these are microcapillary tubes that have been spun down in the centrifuge. And you can see that the bottom part of these tubes consists of the pack cells, or red blood cells, and the top part of the tube consists of the blood plasma. Normally, blood plasma is a nice straw-colored. Uh, if it's darker than that, let's say it's dark, dark yellow, that could indicate uh, problems with the liver or other organs of the body. If you take a look at the tube on the left, it has a hematocrit of about 48%, which is normal for males, and the one on the right has a hematocrit of about 43%, which would be normal for females. And so this is a very easy test, it's a very quick and expensive test to find out whether or not somebody has the correct amount of blood cells. Now I'm going to give you a question. So imagine that you have somebody that is dehydrated. Which of the two components of blood is this going to affect the most, the pack cells or the plasma? If you said plasma, you're correct. Dehydration tends to reduce the plasma volume, and as a result, it can cause the hematocrit to become elevated. In this case, the hematocrit doesn't mean that you have any more cells than normal. It just means you have less plasma than normal. So sometimes the hematocrit can be confounded by a patient that is dehydrated. Okay, back to hemoglobin. Remember that red blood cells, or erythrocytes, were basically just small bags of hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is the oxygen-carrying pigment in the bloodstream. Uh, it consists of globin, which is a protein made up of amino acids, and each hemoglobin molecule also consists of four iron ions. And iron is absolutely essential for hemoglobin to work, because it's the iron that transports the oxygen. So hemoglobin truly is a remarkable pigment. It can carry about 98% of the oxygen in the bloodstream. We've tried to synthesize hemoglobin in the laboratory, and so far our attempts have come up short. Another function of hemoglobin is to transport a little bit of the carbon dioxide in the blood. The majority of carbon dioxide is in fact transported by bicarbonate in the plasma, but still about 23% of it is transported on the hemoglobin molecule. It's important to realize that oxygen and carbon dioxide use different sites on the hemoglobin molecule for transport. So carbon dioxide will not interfere with oxygen, and oxygen will not interfere with carbon dioxide. One gas, however, that can interfere with oxygen binding is carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide, which is produced by the combustion of fuels, can bind very, very tightly to the hemoglobin molecule, and as a result, no oxygen can bind. So literally, you can have a person that dies of hypoxia even though their nail beds and their mucous membranes are bright red, and that's because the carbon monoxide has bound to their hemoglobin and has prevented oxygen from binding. Finally, another function of red blood cells is to transmit nitric oxide to the blood vessels. And nitric oxide is a very potent vasodilator that helps to regulate blood pressure. In particular, vasodilators cause blood vessels to open up, and this often will reduce blood pressure. Okay, this slide is here just to remind us that red blood cells, or erythrocytes, have a very, very short lifespan. On average, it's around 100 to 120 days. The reason they have a short lifespan is because they're always squeezing through tight little capillaries, and this squeezing tends to wear out the proteins in the membrane. Because we don't have a nucleus and we don't have any organelles, it's impossible to repair the membrane proteins when they're damaged. 
As a result, we have to remove the worn out red blood cells, both in the spleen and in the liver. But it's also important to realize that we just don't throw the red blood cells away. We, in fact, recycle their breakdown products so that we can make more red blood cells in the future. This rather complicated figure shows the recycling of hemoglobin in the human body. Let's start at number one, where we have red blood cells that are dying and being phagocytized in the liver or the spleen. Remember, phagocytosis just means being eaten by another cell. As those red blood cells are eaten and destroyed, the globin molecules, the protein, is going to be cleaved or broken down to amino acids. These amino acids are going to be transported through the bloodstream to other areas in the body where they can be used to make other proteins or perhaps make more hemoglobin. The heme component is the iron-containing component of the blood. This is going to be transported back to the red bone marrow. So the heme is transported out of the liver or out of the spleen by a carrier molecule called transferrin. Transferrin carries the iron to the liver and eventually from the liver to the red bone marrow. It's essential that this iron not be floating free in the bloodstream because although iron is an essential nutrient for manufacturing hemoglobin, it's also very, very toxic. And so if we have red blood cells that for whatever reason start to rupture and this iron is freed up and it's transported through the blood without the transferrin molecule, it can very quickly lead to kidney damage and possibly liver damage. And it's for this reason that it always has to be transported by the appropriate carrier molecule, transferrin. All right, now let's go look at the remainder of the hemoglobin molecule, and this would be the pigment compounds. The first of these pigments is called biliverdin. If you've taken Spanish, you probably know that verde means green. And this is a green pigment that is eventually converted into bilirubin, which is a yellow pigment. So think, where do we have green pigments in the body? If you said bile, you're correct. Biliverdin is one of the essential components uh, in bile. Now, bilirubin, on the other hand, is transported to the liver, and from the liver, it can be converted into urobilogen in the urinary tract and stercobilin within the digestive tract. Urobilin is eliminated through the kidneys, and it's the principal reason that our urine is yellow. Remember that that yellow product came initially from the breakdown of red blood cells in the hemoglobin molecule. By the same token, the reason that poop is brown is because that some of that urobilogen or bilirubin was converted into stercobilin in the digestive tract. So that's the reason why uh, feces has a color that it does. Now, bilirubin is an important uh, byproduct molecule because it can give us an indicator, uh, among other things, of the health of the liver. Remember, one of the functions of the liver is to excrete bilirubin from the body. And if the liver is not working properly, we can get accumulation of bilirubin and other breakdown molecules within the bloodstream. And this can lead to a yellow coloration of the skin uh, and the sclera of the eyes known as jaundice. So anytime you see a patient that has jaundice, we want to think about an accumulation of bilirubin in the bloodstream. And that might indicate that the liver is not working properly. Okay, so the take-home message for this slide is that red blood cells die very, very frequently because they cannot repair themselves. And as a result, they are phagocytized within the liver or spleen, and their byproducts are transported back to the red bone marrow by the appropriate carrier molecules. Now that we've talked about the process through which red blood cells die and are recycled, let's talk about the process through which they are born again. This process is called erythropoiesis, that is the production of red blood cells. And this occurs in the red bone marrow uh, within the spongy bone. If we're looking at neonates and infants, there's a little bit of this going on uh, in the spleen as well as the liver. The main stimulus for erythropoiesis is hypoxia. That is, as blood cells die off, we have less of an oxygen carrying ability. And as a result, this leads to a lower than normal level of oxygen in the bloodstream. So erythropoiesis falls into basically four different steps. The first step is that we have our pluripotent stem cell in the red bone marrow that will differentiate into something called a proerythroblast. Now remember that blast means a cell that is immature. 
And so these erythroblasts initially will have a nucleus, they will have ribosomes, and they will have other organelles. And this erythroblast will begin to accumulate hemoglobin. And after it accumulates sufficient amounts of hemoglobin, it will actually eject its nucleus and eject most of the organelles. At that time, it will enter the bloodstream as something called a reticulocyte. Now, a reticulocyte is a new red blood cell, but the difference between that and an erythrocyte is that a reticulocyte still retains some of the organelles. And these organelles can be seen under the microscope. And after one to two days uh, in the bloodstream, the reticulocyte will eject the remaining organelles to become an adult erythrocyte. Now, reticulocytes are important because they give us an idea uh, how quickly we're manufacturing blood cells. For example, we could look at somebody's blood and count the number of reticulocytes to figure out whether they're making new cells fast enough. For example, if somebody lost a lot of blood through injury, they would, of course, have a reduced pack cell volume or hematocrit. This would, of course, result in anemia. If we were wondering whether or not they were going to recover from this anemia, we could wait a couple days and then take some blood samples, and we would start looking for reticulocytes. If their body is responding to the anemia by making new cells, we would expect the number of reticulocytes in the bloodstream to increase dramatically. And if it did, we would say this is a regenerative anemia. If, on the other hand, we look in the bloodstream and we don't see any more reticulocytes than normal, it would indicate the body is not responding and that perhaps we might want to consider another treatment to get that person's blood cells back to normal. So like most processes in the body, the production of new red blood cells is regulated by a negative feedback mechanism. The primary stimulus for producing more blood cells is hypoxia. Hypoxia means a lower than normal level of oxygen in the bloodstream. The kidneys are responsible for sensing this hypoxia, and if oxygen levels are too low, the kidney will secrete something called erythropoietin. Uh, erythropoietin is a hormone that will stimulate production of new blood cells. And so the erythropoietin travels through the bloodstream from the kidneys to the red bone marrow. There it's going to stimulate erythropoiesis. That is, it's going to stimulate the differentiation of our stem cells into erythroblasts and those erythroblasts into reticulocytes and eventually functional red blood cells. This increase in red blood cell production will then bring the oxygen levels of the blood back to normal. As a result, the kidneys will reduce their amount of erythropoietin production. And so this is a classical negative feedback mechanism, and it's mediated by the hormone erythropoietin, which is produced by the kidneys. Now, as you might imagine, having a greater number of red cells may give you a competitive advantage. That is, it may give you a greater than normal oxygen carrying ability and therefore greater endurance, uh, particularly if you're participating in some kind of organized athletics. So many serious professional athletes will train at high elevations in order to encounter hypoxia and therefore increase the amount of red blood cells in their bloodstream. In order to do this, they actually have to train up there for several weeks. And even though the percentage of oxygen is the same at altitude, the pressure of oxygen is less. And as a result, the kidneys sense this as hypoxia. And as a result of that, they're going to produce more erythropoietin. Because the erythropoietin stimulates uh, erythropoiesis, uh, we're going to have more blood cells produced in the red bone marrow. And that's eventually going to lead to a higher pack cell volume, or hematocrit. And that might give us a competitive advantage if we're competing in some kind of aerobic sport. So these are two questions you should be able to answer when it comes to be an exam time. Question one. What will an increase in red blood cells accomplish for the athlete? Question two, how does training at high elevations help to increase erythrocyte number? Based on this slide, you should be able to answer these questions. So in the previous slide, we showed that athletes sometimes train at high elevations in order to stimulate their production of erythropoietin. Well, athletes aren't the only people that sometimes need a boost in erythropoietin levels. Oftentimes, you will have a patient that is anemic. That is, they have a low oxygen carrying ability because perhaps they don't have enough red blood cells. We can treat this using a synthetic forms of erythropoietin known as epigen or procrit. So these are just synthetic forms of the hormone that we use to boost red blood cell production in patients in order to treat anemias. 
we frequently use these uh, hormones in people that are on dialysis. People on dialysis generally have kidneys that aren't functioning properly, and as a result, the kidneys aren't producing enough erythropoietin, so the level of red blood cells in the bloodstream will fall. In order to combat this, we'll give people injections of erythropoietin in order to stimulate erythropoiesis and introduce more red blood cells back into the bloodstream. Now, as it turns out, erythropoietin isn't only used by patients that have anemia. If you've been paying attention to the news lately, you've probably heard about Lance Armstrong being stripped of his seven Tour de France titles. And the reason he's being stripped of these titles is because of blood doping, that is, using performance-enhancing substances in order to gain a competitive advantage. And one of the substances that Lance has been accused of using is Procrit, or epigen, that is the synthetic form of erythropoietin. And obviously, by using erythropoietin, he would be able to elevate his red blood cell numbers, let's say from 55 to 60, or maybe even 65, so that he would have a greater reserve of oxygen in his bloodstream, and therefore he may not tire as quickly as people that weren't doping. So that would give him a competitive advantage. But here comes the question that even though blood doping is illegal in sports and obviously is not something that people should do, there's also a health risk to it. That is that taking too much erythropoietin can result in polycythemia. That is a greater than normal level of red blood cells. So we're talking about pack cell volume or hematocrit in excess of 65%. Now, although this gives you a greater oxygen-carrying ability, it also makes your blood incredibly viscous so that the heart has to pump harder in order to get it through the blood vessels and that it's very, very tough to get it through the smallest blood vessels. As a result, sometimes blood can actually clog or become stopped up in the small blood vessels, and this can cause a stroke or a heart attack or even death. And so polycythemia is nothing to laugh about. So people that are taking erythropoietin as a performance-enhancing drug are really taking their life in their own hands, particularly if they become dehydrated, that 65 hematocrit can be elevated to 75, which can become fatal. Before we close our discussion on the red blood cells, we should talk about some disorders associated with erythrocytes. The most common disorder is something called anemia, which, if you remember, is just a reduced ability to carry oxygen. Symptoms for anemia include fatigue and cold intolerance and general paleness or pallor of the skin. And there are several different types of anemia. For example, iron deficiency anemia, we lack iron. And remember, iron is an essential component of hemoglobin. So we might have enough cells in the blood, but if the hemoglobin within those cells doesn't have enough iron, then we're not going to be able to carry as much oxygen. The other type of anemia is pernicious anemia. Here you're lacking a factor that allows you to absorb B12, and B12 is necessary for manufacture of hemoglobin and absorption of iron. On the other hand, hemorrhagic anemia occurs because loss of red blood cells due to excessive bleeding. So if you have somebody that has hemorrhagic fever or has had a severe quantity of blood loss, that is a hemorrhagic anemia. Hemolytic anemias, on the other hand, occur because red blood cells actually lyse or split open. Remember, hemo means blood, and lyse means to split open. And there's various types of diseases that can cause hemolysis, and not only is it dangerous because we're losing red blood cells, but also remember that when the hemoglobin is exposed to the blood plasma, it can travel to organs such as the kidneys and the liver and cause a severe amount of damage. And finally, the last type of anemia is aplastic anemia. And this occurs because the red bone marrow, where blood cells are made, has been destroyed by either chemicals or toxins or radiation. So frequently, people that have undergone radiation treatments for different types of cancers may have to have a bone marrow transplant because the hemopoietic tissue there has been damaged by radiation. Okay, now that we've finished talking about the erythrocytes, let's go on to talk about leukocytes, otherwise known as our white blood cells. As you probably know, the leukocytes are important for immune defense. That is, they are combating infectious agents such as bacteria, viruses, and they're even helping us to eliminate cancerous cells from the body. So first, let's look at the structure of white blood cells. In general, they tend to be somewhat larger than red blood cells. Remember, a red blood cell was about 7.5 to 8 microns in diameter. In comparison, white blood cells are somewhere between 8 to 15 to even 20 microns in diameter, so they're very large. They're also comparatively rare. 
remember white blood cells comprise less than 1% of total circulating blood cells. And so if you're looking at blood through the microscope, you actually have to look for a long time through several fields of view before you'll come upon a white blood cell. So if you saw something that was at right, like you do now, where, where we see several white blood cells in one field of view, that would be very abnormal and would indicate somebody that was having a chronic infection. Okay, another thing about white blood cells is that unlike red blood cells, they do in fact have a nucleus. As a result, some of the white blood cells live for quite a long time. Some of them can live for several years. Unlike red blood cells, white blood cells do not have hemoglobin, so they do not carry oxygen at all. That is the primary and only job of the red blood cells. And finally, white blood cells can be divided into two groups, the granular leukocytes, which have granules within the cytoplasm, and the agranular leukocytes, which do not have granules. Other important stuff to know about white blood cells, that just like red blood cells, they are made in the red bone marrow, although some move to the thymus to mature, and these are called T-cells or T-lymphocytes, and we'll talk about these in a later chapter. The other thing that differentiates white blood cells from red blood cells is that they can actually leave the blood vessels and circulate within the tissues in the lymphatic system. This is important because infection doesn't always occur in the blood, and if the infection's in the body tissues, the white blood cells have to be able to move out of the blood vessels to the site of the infection. So this picture here shows the process of diapodesis. Diapodesis is the process through which white blood cells can move out of the blood vessels and into the surrounding tissues. Basically, they are attracted to the size of the blood vessels by something called selectins. And selectins are molecules that are expressed in the site of an injury. So imagine that an injury has happened somewhere below this blood vessel. So selectins would be expressed in the blood vessel wall, and that would cause the white blood cell to emarginate or roll and begin to stick along the wall of the blood vessel. It would then be able to squeeze itself between the cells that make up the endothelium of the capillary, and eventually it could squeeze itself all the way out to the other side of the capillary into the interstitial spaces where the infection might be. To me, diapodesis is similar to the process that rats use to get into your house. You can have a very small hole in your house and somehow a rat can get through. Uh, I remember once living in a house that had just a small hole in the corner of the room. It probably wasn't even as large as a quarter. But yet this rat, which to me looked about the size of a woodchuck, was routinely able to squeeze himself through this hole and enter my bedroom so it could chew on any food that I left in the room. Now let's take a closer look at the different types of white blood cells, otherwise known as leukocytes. Leukocytes are divided into two categories, the granulocytes, which have granules, and the agranulocytes, which do not have granules. The granulocytes are classified based on the staining properties of the granules. There are two different dyes that are used to stain blood cells. One of them is a basic dye, and the other one is acidic. The basic dye stains things dark blue or purple. For example, the nucleus of all white blood cells stains dark blue or purple. Whereas the acidic dye, known as eosin, tends to stain the cytoplasm, and it has a bright pink to orange coloration. So the granulocytes are classified based on the staining properties of the granules. The first of the granulocytes are the neutrophils. Neutrophils are the most common white blood cell, accounting for 60 to 70 percent of the blood cells by number. They are called neutrophils because the granules stain equally with both the eosin, which is pink, and the basic dye, which tends to be blue. As a result, the granules don't really stand out from the background color of the cytoplasm. So neutrophils are the first responders to bacterial infections, uh, particularly if you get a new bacterial infection, the numbers of neutrophils will increase exponentially. And neutrophils kill bacteria through the process of phagocytosis. They literally ingest the bacteria, and they can also kill them with something called a respiratory burst. That is, they release a potent germ-killing compound, such as hydrogen peroxide or bleach, to actually kill the bacterium. The next type of granulocyte are the eosinophils. Eosinophils are quite rare. They basically compose less than 2% of the total number of white blood cells. So you'll often have to look around a whole slide of a blood smear to be able to identify an eosinophil. As the name implies, these granulocytes have bright pink to bright orange staining granules. And once you see an eosinophil, you'll never mistake another cell for it again. The nucleus on eosinophils is a bilobe structure. It looks kind of like an old telephone receiver. 
and one of the functions of eosinophils is to attack and destroy large infectious bodies. These are things like parasitic worms. Think about roundworms or tapeworms, which maybe aren't too common in the United States, but in developing countries are quite common. And so these destroy these large infectious bodies by secreting a toxin which punches holes in the worms and actually destroys them. The other thing that eosinophils may do is help to mediate the severity of allergic reactions. Uh, the next cell we're going to learn about is a basophil, which releases histamine, and histamine causes inflammation, whereas the eosinophils may actually reduce inflammation, thereby moderating the immune response. The last group of granulocytes are the basophils. As the name implies, these have dark purple staining granules, and the granules are very numerous, uh, so numerous that you can't even see the nucleus of this cell. This cell is quite a bit smaller than neutrophils or eosinophils. It's about 8 to 10 microns, which makes it just a little bit larger than a red blood cell. And again, basophils are very, very rare. They're less than one half of 1% of white blood cells. And so to find a basophil in a normal blood smear, you often have to look through an entire smear, an entire slide, to identify maybe just one or two basophils. Basophils contain histamine granules. Remember, histamine causes inflammation, and it's released in areas of infection or tissue damage. And the inflammation that occurs causes some pain, which is bad, but it also causes vasodilation of blood vessels in the area, which helps to bring more blood cells to the area of tissue damage so that they can clean up dead and dying tissue and also take care of any bacteria or viruses that may have entered through the wound. Now let's move on to the agranulocytes. As the name implies, there are no granules in these white blood cells. The first of the agranulocytes are the monocytes, which account for about 5% of the circulating white blood cells. Monocytes are large cells, which can be anywhere from about 12 to 20 microns, so oftentimes they're over twice the size of a red blood cell, so they're very easy to identify. As I said before, there are no granules in the cytoplasm, and the nucleus here is quite large. It is often horseshoe shaped, or at least kidney bean shaped. Monocytes become active during chronic infections, and during these infections they will differentiate into something called macrophages. Macrophage literally means big eating cell, and these cells destroy microbes by literally gobbling them up. They're the most phagocytotic white blood cell that we have. Uh, macrophages are generalists. They will take care of bacteria and viruses and virus infected cells. But the big take-home message here is that they are active during chronic infections, that is, infections that have gone on for a long time. So take, for example, tuberculosis, which is a respiratory disease. Initially, upon infection, it will be the neutrophils that respond and begin to attack the bacteria. But because tuberculosis is resistant to destruction by neutrophils, it will be the monocytes that take on the work in the long term. The next type of agranulocytes are the lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are quite numerous, accounting for anywhere between 20 and 30 percent of the circulating white blood cells. So they're second in number only to the neutrophils. Uh, lymphocytes vary widely in diameter. They can be anywhere as small as 5 microns, that is smaller than a red blood cell, all the way up to 17 microns. Lymphocytes can be identified by their large prominent circular nucleus and the nucleus takes up the majority of the cell so that the cytoplasm can be seen as only a, a thin ring of blue around the nucleus. Lymphocytes can be divided into three different categories, the B cells, the T cells, and also the natural killer cells. Like the other cells we've talked about so far, natural killer cells are generalists. They can attack many different types of cells. They destroy these invading cells through programming something called apoptosis, which is cell death. The other two types of cells are very specific, and we tend to think of them as the assassins or the navy seals of the immune system. So they're not out there to attack bacteria or viruses, they're out there to attack a certain type of bacteria, for example an E. coli or a certain type of virus. So both of these have specificity. B cells are called B cells because they undergo immunocompetence in the red bone marrow, and B cells destroy pathogens using something called antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that are secreted by the cell and they float throughout the blood plasma until they encounter the pathogen. At that point they will eliminate the pathogen through a variety of means which are demonstrated by the acronym PLAN, 
standing for precipitation, lysis, agglutination, and neutralization. We'll talk more about plan later on when we talk about the specific immune response. The other type of lymphocyte are the T cells. T cells are called T cells because they undergo immunocompetence in the thymus. And these cells cannot directly attack a virus or a bacteria, but instead they attack infected cells. So if we have a virus infected cell, the T cell will bind to that cell and cause that cell to die by releasing something called lymphotoxin or by inducing apoptosis, which is a type of programmed cell death. One thing we should point out about B and T cells is that both of these cells have immunological memory. That is, once we encounter a pathogen one time, we will remember that pathogen, and if we're infected with a pathogen a second time, uh, years down the road, we will mount a much greater immune response against that pathogen. And this is the reason why some diseases you only get once in your lifetime. For example, chickenpox. That's because our B and T cells remember the pathogen and are able to deal with it much more efficiently the second time around. So we said previously that white blood cells are able to move out of the bloodstream by squeezing through the cells that make up capillaries. But one question you might be asking yourself is how in the heck does a white blood cell know where an infection is? Well, the answer is, is that in an area of an infection or tissue damage, the tissues will express something called selectins. And selectins are basically markers that tell the white blood cells, here's the infection. And it causes the white blood cells to slow down and roll along the surface of the blood vessel. We call this process emargination. They then will undergo the process of diapodesis and move to the site of the infection. And they'll actually track the bacteria or viruses through a process called chemotaxis. Remember, chemo means chemical, and taxis, think of meaning taxi, and this is basically the ability of a white blood cell to sniff out uh, bacterial proteins and migrate to them and kill them. So chemotaxis enables bacteria to be more efficient in finding the area of infection and eliminating the bacteria once they get there. So because white blood cells have different jobs, we can look at the numbers of white blood cells in each category to determine what type of infection you might have. In that case, we would do something called a differential white blood cell count. Now this can be done manually or it can also be done by a machine. To do it manually, you simply make a blood smear, stain that smear, and go through and count the different numbers of white blood cells. And then you come up with a percentage. So normal percentages of neutrophils are 60 to 70% but they can be elevated during recent bacterial infections. On the other hand, lymphocytes have a normal concentration of 20 to 25 percent and they tend to increase if there's a viral infection. Monocytes have a normal level of around 3 to 8 percent but they increase with both viral and fungal infections. Whereas eosinophils are normally quite rare, 2 to 4 percent, but increase markedly during parasite infections or some allergic reactions. And finally, basophils are extremely rare, normally less than 1% of circulating white blood cells. But we can see increases if there's allergic reaction or conditions known as hypothyroid. In case you're wondering, yes, I will expect you to know which leukocytes are most abundant and which are least abundant for the exam. If that seems like a daunting task, have no fear. There's a long-standing mnemonic device that can help you to remember the order of the leukocytes. And that mnemonic device is never let monkeys eat bananas. That gives you the abundance from most abundant to least abundant. Never, standing for neutrophils, let for lymphocytes, monkeys for monocytes, eat for eosinophils, and bananas for basophils. So neutrophils are most abundant and basophils are least abundant. So if you remember, never let monkeys eat bananas, you'll never forget the order of the leukocytes again. So here you can see a lab report from a hematology workup. Uh, hematology, by the way, is the study of blood. And remember, we will often take a blood sample if somebody has an infection or symptoms that are nonspecific, and we're trying to pin down what that is so we can make a diagnosis. So if you take a look at the second row, you can see the different abundances of the white blood cells. And you can see on right, there's sort of like an idiot bar that tells you whether things are too low or too high or just right. And you can see that most of the white blood cells are within normal limits, except for the eosinophils. The eosinophils are, in fact, quite elevated. So what do you think an elevated eosinophil count would mean? If you said parasitic worm infection, you are correct. 
So whether it's a manual count or an automated count done by a hematology machine, a differential white blood cell count can be an essential diagnostic tool for finding out what type of infection somebody has. Before we end this lecture, we should talk about some leukocyte disorders. One of these is leukocytosis. Cytosis just means greater than normal levels. So leukocytosis indicates a greater than normal level of leukocytes. And we can be specific and say, for example, that somebody has lymphocytosis, or we can say that they have neutrophilia. Either one of these indicates an increase in white blood cells above normal levels. On the other hand, leukopenia indicates a reduction in white blood cells below normal levels. So, for example, if you had lymphopenia, that would indicate a lower than normal level of lymphocytes. The next two disorders are leukemia and mononucleosis. Leukemia is a type of cancer affecting the bone marrow that causes an overproliferation of white blood cells. On the other hand, mononucleosis is an infectious disease caused by a virus which causes abnormal sized monocytes. Infectious mononucleosis is sometimes called the kissing disease. It is a highly contagious viral disease caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. The diagnostic feature here is the presence of excessive levels of atypical agranulocytes, mainly lymphocytes. They tend to be larger and normal and look more like monocytes in size and shape. Mononucleosis causes malaise, that is tiredness, as well as a chronic sore throat and a low-grade fever. If you've had mono, you know that there's no cure except for good bed rest, and this infection typically runs its course in a few weeks. Leukemia, on the other hand, is caused by a cancer within the red bone marrow. The name leukemia literally means white blood, which is quite apt, as this disease is characterized by a severe overproliferation of white blood cells. Leukemias can be divided into one of two major types. Acute leukemia is characterized by a rapid increase in the number of immature blood cells known as blasts. These cells crowd out the normal hemopoietic tissue and thus prevents the bone marrow from making healthy blood cells. On the other hand, chronic leukemia is characterized by the excessive buildup of relatively mature but still abnormal white blood cells. Chronic leukemia takes months to years to progress, and unlike acute anemia, which must be treated immediately, Chronic forms are sometimes monitored for some time before treatment to ensure maximum effectiveness of the therapy. Acute leukemias tend to be more common in children, whereas chronic leukemias tend to be more common in older people. Both forms of leukemia can be treated with chemotherapy and or radiation. You have now come to the end of part one of the lecture on blood. Before proceeding on to part two, please test your comprehension of the material discussed by answering the following quiz questions. You will not be graded on these questions, however, if you score less than 70%, you may want to go back and review the lecture again before proceeding on to part two. Okay, welcome to Zoology 142. We're going to start our second lecture on blood. Today we'll be talking about hemostasis and also about blood types. So last time we talked about the different formed elements that made up blood, and those include the erythrocytes and the leukocytes. And another formed element we haven't yet talked about are the platelets. Platelets themselves aren't actually cells. They are actually fragments of cells derived from something called a megakaryocyte that fractures into lots of little pieces. And so the function of these platelets, as you probably well know, is to help in blood clotting, a process called hemostasis. And this blood clotting is not only essential for healing broken blood vessels, but also keeping leaks from forming in really undamaged blood vessels as well. So as I said before, platelets are cell fragments derived from megakaryocytes. They actually comprise less than 1% of blood solids, but again, very important hemostasis. 
So if you take a look at the picture above, you're going to see what an inactivated platelet looks like. Uh, basically, they're about two to three microns long. They look like little bitty rice krispies, and normally they float around the bloodstream doing absolutely nothing. However, if we have a break in a blood vessel that exposes connective tissue to these platelets, they will then change in shape very quickly and very radically. So down below, you can see some pictures of activated platelets. How do they look different? You can see that they have little bitty cytoplasmic extensions that are sometimes called pseudopodia that are extending out and connecting with other platelets. So once a platelet is activated, it will soon activate other platelets and help to start the blood clot, which is one of the first parts of hemostasis. So just to back up, hemostasis is the stoppage of bleeding in a quick and localized fashion when a blood vessel is damaged or injured. It helps to prevent hemorrhage. As you probably know, a hemorrhage is a massive release of blood caused by an injury. For example, severing of an arm or hemorrhagic fever all causes massive amounts of blood loss or hemorrhage. And so the steps to preventing hemorrhage and stopping hemorrhage is something called hemostasis, literally to stop blood. And the steps are divided into three parts. The first of these is the vascular spasm. The second is platelet plug formation. And finally, the third is formation of the blood clot. And so we're going to go through each of these in some detail. Okay, so the first step of hemostasis is the vascular spasm. And this is where we have a reflexive contraction of a damaged blood vessel. So I want you to imagine you're walking down the beach, you're not paying particular attention where you're going, and you step on a piece of glass and cut your foot open. So the first thing that's going to happen, aside from bleeding, is that these small blood vessels in your foot are going to reflexively contract in order to limit the amount of blood loss. And this helps to reduce blood loss in small vessels like arterioles and small arteries. It's not going to be very effective at stopping blood loss, let's say, in the carotid artery or in the brachial artery, which are very large and transmit a whole lot of blood. But it does help these smaller vessels to constrict a little bit, so there's time for the other hemostatic mechanisms to happen. Okay, so the second part of hemostasis is the platelet plug formation. And this occurs when platelets become activated. And the reason that platelets become activated is they come into contact with connective tissues that are not normally found within the blood vessel. So if you burst a blood vessel, if you break it open, the connective tissues to make up the outside of that blood vessel are going to protrude into the inside. And that's going to activate our platelets. Uh, the platelets then start this reaction where they chemically activate other platelets. And this causes these little extension of the cytoplasmic processes I was talking about earlier. We call those pseudopodia. So if you look in the middle picture, you can see what's happening when platelets become activated. These platelets are also going to release some vasoconstrictors, such as thromboxin and serotonin, that are going to further help to limit the amount of blood coming to the area. And they also release ADP, which activates the other platelets, forming this sticky platelet plug. So I should point out that platelets are only one part of the hemostatic mechanism. We also need several different types of blood factors, including fibrin or fibrinogen, in order to have successful hemostasis. So during blood clotting, thrombin, which is an enzyme, will help to convert our fibrinogen, which was liquid and soluble, into an insoluble and very sticky form called fibrin. So at the right of the screen, you can see the red blood cells that are tied up in what looks like this Spider-Man network of threads. And these are the sticky fibrin threads that are created when fibrinogen is converted into fibrin by the enzyme thrombin. In order for this to happen, we actually need quite a bit of vitamin K around. So if we don't have vitamin K, blood clotting can oftentimes be delayed or may not happen at all. Now, it's very important because these fibrin threads form a meshwork that will grab a hold of other blood cells, grab a hold of platelets, and then it will begin to form a blood clot. Now, during the clotting process, the fibrin threads will actually contract. If you look within them, they actually have what looks to be actin and myosin. And remember, these were proteins that were found within muscle cells. And so the actin and myosin fibers that are in with this blood clot help to constrict and consolidate the clot until we have a very watertight plug. So the last few slides we just looked at showed the three main steps in hemostasis. The first of these was the vascular spasm, followed by the platelet plug formation, finally followed by blood clotting. In truth, the third step, the blood clotting, involves a lot more steps. If you take a look at 648 in your textbook, you will see this figure that shows both the intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway of blood coagulation. Now, I'm not going to hold you responsible for all the detail in this figure, but I do want to give you a little bit of background in these two different pathways and tell you the main differences in them.
So let's take a look at the first of these steps called the intrinsic pathway. This is called the intrinsic pathway because the factors needed for blood clotting are actually present within the blood itself. Here, clotting is initiated by negatively charged surfaces, for example, activated platelets are negatively charged, as is collagen in a damaged blood vessel, or even the glass in a phlebotomy tube. This is the reason why you can draw blood out with a syringe and put it in a phlebotomy tube, and without any anticoagulants, it will clot after a matter of time. One disadvantage to the intrinsic pathway is that it is very slow because there are many steps needed. For example, look at the right hand side of this figure and you can see where surfaces, for example, collagen uh, causes the conversion of clotting factor 12A into clotting factor 12 and that causes the conversion of clotting factor 11 into 11A and so on and so on and so on. And so it takes many, many steps before we get the conversion of soluble fibrinogen into that sticky fibrin that helps us with hemostasis. So the big picture here is to remember that the primary stimulus for the intrinsic pathway is something within the blood that is activated platelets or within a damaged blood vessel that is collagen. And this collagen or these platelets uh, are negatively charged and they will start the intrinsic pathway which will cause blood clotting within a matter of several minutes. On the other hand, with the extrinsic pathway, clotting is initiated by something called tissue factor, which comes from outside the blood. In comparison to the intrinsic pathway, the extrinsic pathway is much faster because there are fewer steps. So take a look at the left-hand side of this figure. You see that we have tissue factor derived from damaged tissue, which gives us clotting factor number 7, which is converted into clotting factor number 10, which is converted into 10A, and eventually we get fibrinogen converted into that sticky fibrin. And so there's a lot fewer steps, and as a result, hemostasis can happen within maybe 15 seconds using the extrinsic pathway. So big picture is that the extrinsic pathway is triggered by factors outside of the blood vessels and blood, whereas the intrinsic pathway is triggered by factors inside the blood or blood vessels. The extrinsic pathway tends to work a lot faster than the intrinsic pathway because there's a lot fewer steps. However, you should remember that normally both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways are operating simultaneously to help us achieve hemostasis. Again, the result of both pathways is that we get the conversion of soluble fibrinogen into a very sticky, gooey substance called fibrin that helps to bind the blood cells together, that helps to bind platelets together, and form a very tight and compact platelet plug that will stop the bleeding until that blood vessel can be repaired. So like other homeostatic mechanisms in the body, uh, the process of blood clotting is controlled by a fine array of factors that both promote clotting and also inhibit it. So although the initial clotting is under positive feedback, we very quickly limited that positive feedback so that we don't have too much clot formation because there's two evils here. One, we could have not enough clot formation, in which case we could bleed out because of hemorrhage. On the other hand, we could also have too much clotting, and as we'll see in the next slide, if we have inappropriate clotting or too much clotting, that can be very life-threatening as well. So clots tend to be localized because fibrin absorbs thrombin, and remember thrombin was the enzyme that is used to convert fibrinogen into fibrin. In addition to that thrombin being absorbed by the clot, it will also produce something called prostacyclin, which is a powerful inhibitor of platelet adhesion and release. Anything that inhibits coagulation is called an anticoagulant. As I said previously, your body manufactures a number of anticoagulants, but we also use anticoagulants in the medical field. So, for example, patients who are at an increased risk for forming blood clots may receive an anticoagulant drug such as heparin or warfarin. Even despite our natural anticoagulants, as well as any we might be administering to a patient, we do occasionally get inappropriate blood clots in a patient, and these can be life-threatening, and we'll talk about these in the next slide. So the reason we use these blood thinners that we just talked about is to prevent inappropriate intravascular clotting. Remember, intravascular means within the vessel. And so what we're trying to prevent here is something called thrombosis, which is a clot forming in an unbroken blood vessel. And so why does it form? Well, first of all, as blood vessels age, they get a little rough in the lining. Uh, the lining gets abraded. There are some deposits of calcium and fats and other things in there that can make the platelets start to react a little bit. And they also slow blood down at occlusions, at areas where the blood vessel becomes narrow. And those cases where blood cells slow down, we're much more likely to have a thrombus form. 
Now some thrombi may dissolve spontaneously or more dangerously they can dislodge and then travel to a distant place. And in this case we call it an embolus. An embolus is a blood clot on the move. And emboli are very, very dangerous because they tend to travel quickly through the circulatory system and they lodge at a very small juncture where they will usually completely occlude the blood vessel and therefore lead to ischemia or lack of oxygen of all the downstream tissues. And unless we use the clot busting drugs very quickly to get through there, it uh, can very quickly lead to the death of those tissues. And so this is one of the primary causes of cerebral vascular accidents or strokes is that we do have a blood clot that's broken loose, it's lodged somewhere in the brain, and if not treated quickly, that part of the brain can just die, causing death or lifetime disability. So again, people at risk for things like intravascular clotting will usually take some kind of anticoagulant on a daily basis to discourage inappropriate clot formation. So here's some examples of some common anticoagulants used in the medical field. Down at bottom left is one you're probably very familiar with is going to be aspirin. Remember, aspirin is a COX inhibitor and COX is one of those enzymes uh, necessary for conversion of arachidonic acid into things like prostaglandins and leukotrienes. But it also has a role in mediating cell adhesion between the platelets and, and fibrin. So it basically reduces blood clotting. So people that are at risk for blood clots may take a low dose of baby aspirin once a day. More serious cases or people at more serious risk may be taking drugs like Coumadin and Warfarin. Uh, these are pretty much very similar or the same drugs, just different forms, and we'll talk more about them in a minute. But those are powerful anticoagulants that can be taken in small amounts to prevent blood clotting. The one at the bottom there is heparin, and heparin, as I said earlier, is an injectable drug. We would typically dilute it many times and use it to flush out catheters to prevent blood clotting within these devices. So this slide shows another anticoagulant you probably wouldn't want to give a patient, but it's actually some of the same material that we do give the patient in the hospital. So rat killers like Decon include the uh, chemical warfarin in there, and warfarin is a very potent anticoagulant. If you've ever seen a rat that's been killed with rat poison, you realize that they're very disoriented, they're probably bleeding out the mouth, bleeding out the mucosa, bleeding out the eyes, and so that we give them warfarin, it basically binds up all the vitamin K in the body and prevents blood clotting, and all of a sudden you get this massive amount of hemorrhage. The point of this slide is to realize that medications, which are effective in small doses, can actually become poisons at moderate to larger doses. And in fact, each year in hospitals, uh, there's some fatalities and near fatalities because nurses or doctors uh, calculate the incorrect dose of anticoagulants like Coumadin and heparin. And if you don't catch it quickly, it can very quickly uh, kill a patient. Of course, any discussion of blood clotting wouldn't be complete without talking about some of the disorders associated with hemostasis. And probably the one you're most familiar with is something called hemophilia. And this is an inherited disease caused by a lack of clotting factors. And as a result, people that have minor cuts or nicks that are hemophiliacs will tend to have bleeding for an extended period of time. And so even a very minor wound can be life-threatening and require medical attention. As I said before, it tends to be an inherited condition. There are three different types of hemophilia. Somebody with hemophilia A lacks clotting factor number eight, and this is present in males only and is definitely the most common form of hemophilia. If you're wondering what clotting factor eight is, turn on over to page 648 in your textbook, and you can see there are very complicated clotting cascade necessary for blood to actually clot. And so you can look midway down and see where clotting factor eight is. And so if these people don't have clotting factor eight, they have to carry it with them or usually go to a hospital if they cut themselves to get the appropriate clotting factor. On the other hand, somebody with hemophilia B lacks clotting factor number nine. Again, this is present in males only. And finally, hemophilia C is present in both males and females, but is less severe because the alternate clotting factors do exist within the bloodstream. So either way, the way that we treat people with hemophilia that have had a bruise or a cut is to take them to the hospital and give them a transfusion of clotting factors or concentrates that are missing from their bloodstream. All right, so now we're moving on to blood types, and you've probably heard the term blood type before. You may even know your blood types, 
and blood types deal with antigens that are on the surface of red blood cells and basically the reason we need to know the types is to know whether or not we have a compatible blood donor for you. If you're in the hospital and you're going to have to receive blood because you're getting surgery or because you've been in an accident and you've lost some blood, we want to make sure that we give you a compatible blood type that does not cause a reaction because the reactions that occur can be fatal. So the common blood types you're probably familiar with are A, B, A, B, and O. Now there are many more blood types than this, but these are the most common ones and the ones that if we don't get them right and uh, match you with a compatible type uh, can lead to the most severe reactions. So we're going to concentrate on the A, B, O blood types, but just remember there are others as well. So if you remember from the previous slide, I was saying that the blood types are based on the presence of antigens. And antigens are glycoproteins that are found on the surface of most cells in the body. Uh, and for example, they're found on the surface of red blood cells. And they're there to help our body distinguish between the cells that belong and the cells that don't belong. So for example, your red blood cells would have a different type of antigen than, let's say, a bacterial cell or maybe uh, a parasitic worm, and it would help our body recognize which things need to be eliminated and which things need to be left alone. So whereas antigens are proteins on the surfaces of our cells, antibodies are proteins that are made by white blood cells, and their job is to destroy non-self antigens. The antibodies bind with the antigens in a lock and key fit, and so only one type of antibody will fit a complementary antigen and if it does bind uh, it's going to mark that cell for destruction. So as you can imagine it's probably not a good idea to make antibodies that are keyed to our own antigens. The reason is if we did we would basically be killing our own cells and that actually sometimes does happen when we have autoimmune diseases. But in general the body makes antibodies to all the antigens it does not have, but does not make antibodies to the antigens that it does have. So the ABO blood types are based on the presence of two major antigens on the red blood cells. That is antigen A and antigen B. You might be asking yourself, where is antigen O? Well, antigen O basically means you have neither antigen A or antigen B. So I like to think of O as meaning zero. I have zero antigens on the surface of my cell. Now this next statement is very important, so memorize it. The immune cell makes antibodies for all the antigens you do not have. For example, if you have type A blood, well that means you have type A antigens on your cells, and that means you will only make type B antibodies. You will not make type A because that would attack your cells. You can only receive blood from donors whose blood does not contain antibodies to your own cells. For example, if I have type A blood, uh, I cannot receive um, blood from somebody that has type B because they will have type A antibodies. Remember the rule is we make antibodies to all the antigens we do not have. So we'll take a look at some examples in the next few slides and hopefully you'll understand blood compatibility a little bit better. Okay, so our first example is going to be somebody with type A blood. Uh, if they have type A blood, that means they have A antigens present on the surface of the red blood cells. Now remember the rule is that I will only make antibodies to the antigens that I do not have. So what antigen do I not have on my cells? I don't have B. And so in that case I'm going to make anti-B antibodies. And remember the antibodies themselves are not on the cell surface but they are floating around in the plasma. And so here you can see the little green bees floating around in the plasma. Those are anti-B antibodies. Now the anti-B antibodies don't interact with our A antigen because they are not complementary. Basically it's like a lock that does not fit a key or vice versa. So even though they're coexisting, there's no kind of reaction happening because the lock, in this case the antigen, does not bind with a key, in this case the antibody. Now let's look at somebody with type B blood. Remember the blood type indicates the antigens that are present on the surface of the red blood cells. So somebody with type B blood is going to have type B antigens on the surface of their erythrocytes. And remember the rule that we make antibodies to all the antigens we do not have, and the antigen that we do not have here is antigen A. So in response to that, our blood is going to contain anti-A antibodies. 
And again, these anti-A antibodies are floating around in the plasma. They're not interacting with our red blood cells because we don't share uh, the lock and key fit. On the other hand, if I were to give this person some A blood, I might get some reaction as my antibodies are binding to their antigens. And so we wouldn't want to give somebody with type B blood type A blood because it could lead to a reaction. Now let's look at type AB blood. This is my blood type. So if I have type AB blood, that means I have both the A antigen and the B antigen present on the surface of my red blood cells. Also, remember the rule about antibodies, that I only produce antibodies against antigens which I do not have. But I have antigen A and antigen B. The result is that I don't produce any antibodies. So here you see no little antibodies floating around in the bloodstream. And this is important because somebody with type AB blood is oftentimes called the universal recipient because they can get type A blood, they can get type B blood, and they can get type AB blood, and they can get type O blood. And that's because they don't have the antibodies circulating in the plasma that would attack the donor cells. Now let's look at type O blood. Remember that I said before O is not really a blood type. That is, it's not a type of antigen. O, in this case, I want you to think of as meaning zero, meaning that there are zero antigens present on the surface of the red blood cell. So you can see that our red blood cell here looks like a big bald head with no antigens on the surface. Now, remember the rule about antibodies, that we make antibodies to the antigens that we do not have. And the antigens that we do not have are antigen A and antigen B. As a result, we make both A and B antibodies. And so somebody with type O blood would react if you give them A blood, they would react if you gave them B blood, and they would certainly react if you gave them AB blood. So somebody with type O blood should really only receive type O blood. On the other hand, we can give type O blood to just about everybody because the recipient's antibodies will not attack any of its antigens. It has no antigens. Now we're going to complicate things just a little bit more to talk about a third type of antigen known as the RH factor. Uh, the RH factor was originally described from the rhesus monkey, not the rhesus pieces. And what it is, is it's an antigen that's present on the surface of sun red blood cells. And so if you have that antigen, we say that you are RH positive. If you don't have the RH antigen, we say that you're RH negative. So in that case, it's just like the A antigen and the B antigen, but now it's a third antigen called the RH antigen. But here's where things are different. Remember the rule before that I make antibodies to all the antigens I do not have. So imagine somebody with type A negative blood. That would mean they had the A antigen, but not the RH antigen. Normally, you would think of them making antibodies against B and also against RH. Well, this is not quite the case with RH factor. That is, initially, we do not make antibodies if we are RH negative. It's only if we are exposed to that antigen once that after that initial exposure, we will then begin to produce anti-RH antibodies. And that's important because we can get away with uh, a, mitch, a mismatched uh, RH uh, blood type once through a transfusion. Uh, theoretically, you would never do this, but you could theoretically get away with it once. But you couldn't get away with it twice because over the successive weeks after the initial transfusion, you will start to make RH antibodies, which will cause a reaction the second time you're given RH positive blood. So for that reason, we try to match RH factors as well as ABO factors as much as possible when we're giving a blood transfusion. Okay, so by transfusion, I mean either a transfer of whole blood, in that case both red blood cells and plasma, or sometimes we're just transferring the packed cells, that is the red blood cells and maybe the white blood cells, and sometimes we're just transferring the plasma. Either way, we want to make sure that we avoid a transfusion reaction. So we're going to type both the donor blood and also the recipient blood and make sure that they're compatible, that they don't have any antigens that are going to cause a reaction. We're also going to do something called cross match where we mix a little bit of the donor blood with a little bit of the recipient blood just to see if there's any type of reaction under the microscope. So given this, I'm going to give you the following question. If somebody has type AB positive blood, what blood types can they receive? Can they receive A negative? Can they receive O positive? 
So, so far we've been talking about blood typing as a way to make sure that we don't have a transfusion reaction. And you might be wondering, well, how bad is this transfusion reaction? What would it look like? Well, if you look down at the bottom right, you can see an example of transfusion reaction. This is where we've mixed a little bit of blood from a donor with a little bit of blood from a recipient. And as it turns out, these two blood types uh, aren't compatible. The process you see there with the clumping is called agglutination and it's a very bad sign. Uh, fortunately, if we do this experiment uh, outside the body on a microscope slide, it just tells us that we have an incompatible donor and recipient and that we shouldn't try to do that transfusion with those blood types. But if we had that agglutination happening within the bloodstream of the recipient, it could very quickly lead to death. So we want to be sure to avoid any type of agglutination. And at top right, you can see an example microscopically of what that agglutination would look like. There you can see the red cells, which are the big red circles. And then the blue Y things are the actual antibodies. Remember, antibodies are proteins. In this case, the antibodies are binding with the red blood cells, and they're clumping them together. Uh, they're causing hemolysis or rupture of red blood cells, which can release all that toxic iron I talked about. And the clumps, the agglutinations they form, can cause massive thrombosis and basically stop up blood vessels. And so, again, transfusion reaction is very, very bad. And that's why we do blood typing, and we also try to cross-match a little of the blood before we do a transfusion. So one of the things we're going to be doing in the lab in the next week or two is doing some blood typing. And blood typing is actually a very, very simple process. We give you a little card or perhaps a little tray that has three different wells in there. And to each one of those wells, you're going to add a drop of the same blood. We're adding the drop of blood from, let's say, the donor, because we want to find out what the donor's blood type is. And so one drop will go in the first square, one drop in the second square, and one drop in the third square. They're all the same blood. And then to the first square, we will add the anti-A antibody. And to the second square, we'll add the anti-B antibody. And to the third square, we'll add the anti-RH antibody. And so if I add the anti-A antibody to the first square, if there are A antigens present on those cells, we will see agglutination or clumping. In this case, agglutination tells us this person has the type A blood type. If we saw clumping, on the other hand, with type B, it would say we had type B blood type. And if we saw the clumping with the third square, the RH, it would indicate that they are RH positive. So take a look at this blood card here, in which we only see clumping within the first square. What blood type does this person have? If you said A negative, you are correct. This person has A negative blood. So think about what blood types could a person with A negative blood receive. Okay, now let's go back to RH factors. Remember I said RH acted like an antigen, but the only difference was that if you are RH negative, you don't initially produce antibodies against the RH factor. It's only after an initial exposure that you begin to produce those antibodies. And so this can have a bearing on something called the hemolytic disease of the newborn. And remember, hemolytic means lysing of blood cells, and hemolysis is never a good thing. So we're going to look at a mother during her first pregnancy. Imagine that this mother has Rh negative blood. Initially, she has no antibodies against the Rh factor. Now, it is possible for an Rh negative mother to have an Rh positive offspring. In this case, the Rh positive fetus will have Rh antigens on its blood cells, and during the latter stages of pregnancy and delivery, some of these antigens can get exposed to the mother's bloodstream. So what's going to happen after that baby's born is that the mother will start to produce some anti-RH antibodies. And the reason this is bad is because if she has another RH positive child, that those antibodies can very quickly attack the circulatory system and blood cells of that second fetus and again cause irreparable damage or even death. And it's for this reason that we blood type people, uh, obviously, uh, once we know they're pregnant. And if we find that they are RH negative, we will give them a shot that will prevent them from forming RH antibodies. And this is called the Rogam shot. So blood typing is a typical screening procedure done in several situations, including when we're dealing with an expectant mother. You've now reached the end of part two of the lecture on blood. 
Before going on to take the weekly Laulima quiz, be sure to complete the following quiz questions at the end of the presentation. Although you will not be scored on these questions, uh, you should use your performance to determine how well you understand the material covered. If you score less than a 70% on these questions, I suggest you go back and review the lecture again and maybe take a look at your lecture notes before going on to take this week's La Lima quiz. Remember, the La Lima quiz is due by 11 p.m. on Friday.